What began as a voyage of hope would quickly descend into a nightmarish tale of madness and despair as a wealth-laden Dutch trading ship bound for the Spice Islands was shipwrecked off the coast of Western Australia. The passengers and crew who merely sought a better life, now marooned on a barren, desolate island thousands of miles from civilization. As the survivors desperately fought to stay alive, a dramatic battle between good and evil would unfold as a cast of unusual characters clashed in a deadly power struggle that saw one man lead a tyrannical and increasingly insane reign of terror. This harrowing tale of betrayal, mutiny, desire, and revenge serving as a chilling reminder of the capacity for human beings to turn on each other and descend into pure savagery when faced with extreme circumstances. At the turn of the 17th century, the European spice trade was booming as merchants across the continent desperately raced to acquire new sources of these almost magical ingredients from far across the ocean. Previously unavailable spices such as cinnamon, pepper, and nutmeg were highly prized for their medicinal properties, but most of all for their extraordinary ability to add powerful and interesting flavors to otherwise bland foods. The wealthy were prepared to pay a high price to acquire such ingredients, with spices purchased in the East Indies selling for up to 600 times their original price in European cities. To exploit this lucrative demand, in 1602 the Dutch East India Company was formed, a private trading corporation that could act independently overseas, with the full force and authority of the Dutch government behind it. In 1628, the newly constructed flagship of the Dutch East India Company set sail on her maiden voyage to the Dutch colony of Batavia in the East Indies, the crew tasked with bringing the ship back safely with a cargo hold full to the brim with valuable spices. With such extraordinary profits on offer, there was no shortage of volunteers to undertake the gruelling year-long journey to the Dutch East Indies a journey that would likely result in many never seeing home again due to the dangers involved, but also one that bore the promise of a new and better life should they survive. Many would indeed perish during the journey, however it wouldn't be tropical disease that claimed their lives. Over 340 men, women and children departed on the flagship Batavia on the 28th of October 1628. The sailors, soldiers, merchants, and family members of those on board, nervous but also optimistic for the long journey ahead. The trade fleet of 11 ships was commanded by Francisco Pelsart, a company man whose job was to represent the interests of his paymasters and ensure that the mission was a profitable success, while the Batavia itself was captained by Ariane Jacobs, the skipper responsible solely for the day-to-day -day running of the ship itself. This dual command structure was standard policy for the Dutch East India Company, however the understandable tensions between two competing authority figures were greatly exasperated by the fact that Pelsart and Jacobs loathed each other due to an earlier dispute which involved Pelsart publicly chastising Jacobs for an especially wild and disorderly night of drinking. Trapped on a floating wooden prison for months on end, the pair's mutual animosity was a disaster just waiting to happen, however there was still one more character to add to this already volatile mix. Every story needs a good villain. Enter Geronimus Cornelis. Cornelis was a bankrupt apothecary who was desperate to get as far away from the Dutch Republic as possible. As one of the closest followers of the heretical Dutch painter Johannes Terentius, Cornelis had publicly questioned the existence of heaven and hell, believing that if they did not exist, then one was free to do as they wished, whether good or evil. After all, any emotion that lay in the heart of a man was placed there by the will of God himself. The idea that a man could sin and pursue earthly pleasures with no spiritual consequences had made Cornelis a wanted man, and with the authorities closing in on him, Cornelis thought it prudent to look for a quick escape, taking employment as a junior merchant on the Batavia, which he hoped would afford him a fresh start thousands of miles away from his troubles. For the crew and passengers of the Batavia, a 15,000 mile voyage lay ahead, one that would take them to the other side of the world, aboard one of the finest ships the Dutch had ever built, 
However, as well as being one of the most splendid seafaring vessels on the planet, the Batavia also carried with her the richest cargo to ever leave Amsterdam. Her holds packed with valuable treasures and 12 huge money chests, each one filled with 8,000 silver coins, the immense bounty intended to fuel the fires of Dutch trade throughout the East Indies Empire. The presence of such an incredible fortune had no doubt attracted the attention of the rough and ready crew of the Batavia, many of whom had been born and raised in the gutters of the Dutch Republic. These men who were paid a pittance for their labours, now tantalisingly close to more money than they could ever dream of, laying just inches below their feet. For a man as proudly amoral as Geronimus Cornelis, such a temptation was simply too much to resist and the exiled heretic began to plot how he might seize the Batavia's treasure for himself. Noting the rift between Commander Pelsart and Captain Jacobs, the manipulative Cornelis saw his chance to gain a powerful ally, the would-be mutineer quickly striking up a friendship with Captain Jacobs, shrewdly exploiting the man's hatred of Commander Pelsart as a bonding mechanism. Together, the pair hatched a plot to organise a mutiny, eliminate Pelsart, take control of the ship, and use its vast hoard of treasure to start a new life, far away from the reach of the Dutch East India Company. However, if such an ambitious plan was to stand any chance of success, the Batavia would first have to be isolated from the rest of the trade fleet, as any mutiny on board would easily be crushed with the assistance of the other ships and their crew. Luckily for the conspirators, the skipper knew just what to do. After rounding the Cape of Good Hope, Captain Jacobs deliberately steered the ship off course during a storm, separating the Batavia from the rest of the fleet, and cutting off Commander Pelsart and any potential loyalists from reinforcements. The Batavia now crossed the Indian Ocean alone. Whispers of treason spread through the ship, the mutinous pair attracting more and more like-minded men to their cause, as the silver-tongued Cornelis carefully laid out his plans to conspirators in hushed conversations taking place in the deepest, darkest corners of the ship. Yet despite gathering a small following of committed mutineers, Cornelis and Captain Jacobs knew that many more men would be required if they were to forcefully seize control of the ship. The problem they faced lay in the crew's perception of Commander Pelsart. The man was simply not unpopular enough for any widespread mutiny to take hold. He had treated those under him reasonably and was generally seen as a benign authority figure. Never one to fall victim to circumstances, Cornelis decided to take matters into his own hands. He would engineer a situation so heinous that Commander Pelsart would be forced to take draconian measures against the crew, measures that would surely be seen as unjust and excessively harsh, thus generating the level of hatred and ill-feeling required to turn the majority of the sailors against him. The plan was to arrange for a group of masked mutineers to attack a young female passenger during the dead of night. With no idea who the culprits were, an outraged Commander Pelsart would be forced to discipline the entire crew, almost certainly punishing innocent men in the process, making them far more receptive to the possibility of a mutiny. The plan was promptly carried out, however to the surprise of Cornelis, Commander Pelsart did nothing, instead deciding that it would be prudent to wait until the Batavia reached its destination before carrying out an investigation the lifelong career man unwilling to take any action that might endanger the safety and success of the voyage, and thus damage his standing in the company. The disappointed mutineers decided to bide their time and go back to the drawing board, however before any more plans could be formulated, fate intervened. Just weeks away from their destination, on the night of the 4th of June 1629, the Batavia ran aground during a storm on a coral reef, just off the coast of Western Australia, near what is now known as the Hootmerna Brolos Islands. The impact was so severe that the now trapped ship began to break apart as towering waves crashed against it, and many of the passengers and crew were thrown into the churning waters and drowned. The following morning, the captain, commander, and a large number of the survivors gathered whatever supplies they could carry and sailed the ship's longboat to a nearby island that was thankfully only two kilometers away from the wreck site, while Cornelis and several others remained trapped on board the deteriorating but still intact ship. 
After landing on the island, the 300 or so men, women and children soon realised that the new sanctuary was little more than a sandy outcrop that barely kept its head above sea level. The island contained no fresh water, with the only source of food being the handful of birds and sea lions that occasionally came ashore. It was clear that without additional supplies, the inhospitable and isolated island would quickly become the tomb. Convinced that the end was imminent, the survivors lost all hope and began a rapid descent into hedonism and anarchy, raiding what remained of the food and liquor stores as they began gorging and drinking themselves into oblivion, hoping to at least temporarily escape the clutches of despair and torment, no longer thinking of the future as they focused on enjoying what they suspected might be the last few days of their lives. Commander Pelsart did his best to re-establish some semblance of basic order, however marooned on a tiny, barren island so far from civilization, chaos became the new law of the land. Following his fruitless search of the islands, Commander Pelsart and Captain Jacobs led a small group of volunteers to the shores of mainland Western Australia, hoping to find water, food and maybe even some kind of native settlement to which the survivors could be evacuated. However, only a desolate landscape was to greet them. Undeterred, Commander Pelsart decided to press on, leading the search party on a danger-fraught 3,000km journey north to the Dutch colony and flagship's namesake of Batavia, the expedition's original destination, where he planned to raise the alarm and return to the islands at the head of a rescue party. Low on food and water, and with 48 people cramped in a small longboat, the search party's odds of survival were slim indeed, however a quick death at sea might have been preferable to the alternative. The thought of returning back to the madness gripped islands empty-handed, spurring the group onwards. By now, the remains of the Batavia shipwreck were rapidly disintegrating, Cornelis and the handful of men still clinging to life on board, realising that their only chance of survival lay in somehow joining the other survivors on the island. They attempted to make the long swim, grabbing on to anything that would float to aid their journey, yet many sunk beneath the churning waves never to be seen again. One of the lucky few who made it ashore was none other than Cornelis, the fortunate man now finding himself as the highest ranking officer on the island, as most of the other senior crew were attempting to reach the Dutch East Indies on the longboat. With the desperate survivors feeling abandoned by Commander Pelsart, Cornelis saw an opportunity to take advantage of the resentment and chaos and began establishing what was essentially his own personal fiefdom, easily emerging as the undisputed leader of a self-appointed council, which would act as the island's unelected governing body. He set to work issuing edicts and establishing order, setting the survivors to work gathering and rationing supplies that continued to be washed up from the shipwreck, using the ship's sails to funnel rainwater into barrels, digging latrines, organising hunting parties, and gathering all of the resources within his own grand, specially constructed tent, which was now under the protection of his own hand-selected militia, all of whom just so happened to be loyal members of the original planned mutiny. Under the pretense of security, Cornelis disarmed the survivors, gathering together all of the muskets along with anything else that could be used as a weapon, ensuring that only he and his men had access to them. He also seized control of the makeshift boats and rafts the survivors had constructed, trapping everyone on the island. Initially, the survivors were relieved to have a strong leader take charge, and for a while it seemed as though life was improving. However, some amongst the group began to voice concerns over the level of total control Cornelis now wielded. In command of all food, water and resources, and with his own personal army, Cornelis held the power of life and death over every survivor, a feeling of total power that he reveled in. Finally, he had a chance to put into practice the heretical beliefs he had developed over the years. The island would become his personal playground, one where he could indulge in pleasures without conscience and the interference of others. If they could just survive long enough to hijack any rescue ship that might arrive, the mutineers could use the Batavia's immense treasure to start a new life, however in the meantime Cornelis intended to have some fun. 
Yet before he could usher in his new earthly paradise, he would have to eliminate any potential rivals and greatly reduce the number of useless eaters, thus ensuring that his supplies lasted for as long as possible. The main group who posed a threat to Cornelis's regime were the soldiers under the leadership of a man named Hayes. These company mercenaries had been trained for war and were noticeably more disciplined and able than the rest of the survivors. They could not be allowed to live. Cornelis swiftly moved against them, dropping the 22 men off on nearby West Wallaby Island, supposedly to look for water. However, Cornelis knew full well that the island was most likely barren. He had sent them there to die. Another group of around 45 men, women, and children deemed surplus to requirements were tricked into traveling to another nearby island, which is now called Seal Island, where, like the soldiers, they were marooned and left to die. Yet despite disposing of these two large and inconvenient groups, Cornelis was concerned that there were still too many mouths to feed. With food and water supplies rapidly dwindling, many more would need to be disposed of if he was to maximize his chances of living long enough to hijack a rescue ship. At first, the ill, infirm, and weak were eliminated in secrecy, the victims quietly smothered in their sleep, their deaths blamed on natural causes. However, as the days passed, the killings became far less subtle. Other targets would be taken out on fishing or scavenging trips by the mutineer gang. Once the raft had drifted far enough away from prying eyes, the victim would be tied up, thrown overboard, and left to drown, the downfall explained to others as merely a tragic accident. The number of these strange accidents and disappearances continued to grow until all were no longer under any illusions about what was taking place. As many as 125 men, women, and children are thought to have disappeared as Cornelis unleashed a chilling reign of terror, his thugs no longer killing out of any sense of personal survival, but for the sheer pleasure of it, the island becoming a waking nightmare as the mutineers indulged their worst impulses without a care in the world. Cornelis even began toying with his victims, forcing other survivors to kill if they wished to save their own skins, often merely to satisfy his own curiosity over whether they would or not. Survival would require complete obedience to him and him alone. Yet surprisingly, Cornelis never took a single life directly, instead manipulating others into doing the dirty work for him, often under the pretense that the victim was a thief or troublemaker. By corrupting the others, Cornelis was strengthening the mutineer's bond with blood, and ensuring that by the time rescue arrived, there would be nobody left alive who was truly innocent. All non-mutineers had to be eliminated. In his mind, Cornelis had ascended to godhood, however the power he wielded was beginning to go to his head, and his judgement became increasingly impaired as the tyrant fell victim to hubris. The man who had outmaneuvered his rivals for so long was about to make a fatal error. He ordered that all of the so-called useless eaters whom he had earlier marooned on Seal Island be silenced forever. Loyal as ever, his war party of mutineers gleefully carried out their master's bloody command, falling upon the unarmed and shocked inhabitants of Seal Island with terrifying ferocity. However, as the laughing men chased their quarry down, eight men managed to escape the slaughter, covertly paddling away on makeshift rafts they had earlier built. They intended to seek refuge with the only other group in the area, Hayes and the handful of soldiers on West Wallaby Island. Marooned on the supposedly waterless island, Hayes and the rest of the soldiers had achieved the unthinkable and located an abundant supply of fresh water. The island was even home to a population of wallabies, which the soldiers gratefully hunted for meat. With almost unlimited food and water, the soldiers had grown stronger by the day, while Cornelis and the mutineers grew weaker, their dwindling supplies gradually robbing the fallen men of their strength. Hayes had dutifully attempted to alert Cornelis and the other survivors of their astounding success lighting three small fires to send out a smoke signal, as earlier agreed. However, as the days and weeks passed, it became apparent that Cornelis had no intention of rejoining the two groups. Hayes could not understand why the others hadn't come to check on them. After all, he was sure that they would have seen his smoke signal. 
An explanation for the lack of response soon arrives when the shell-shocked eight survivors of Seal Island washed up ashore on the disintegrating rafts. After hearing of the evil that has unfolded, Hayes and the soldiers set to work organising their defences for an attack which they are certain will soon come. Although the two sides are even in numbers, the mutineers are armed with swords, pikes and even muskets, while the soldiers are completely defenceless. However, fueled by a burning desire to exact revenge for the horrors that Cornelis and his men have visited on the survivors, Hayes comes up with a plan that just might work. By concentrating his forces on the high ground overlooking the island's only suitable landing site, Hayes intends to bombard the mutineers with small stones fired from slings the soldiers have hastily crafted from leather, cord and cloth. A series of makeshift forts built from rocks will shelter the defenders from musket fire, while homemade clubs, pikes and swords crafted from driftwood, nails and whatever else the men can find will enable them to engage the invaders in melee on a somewhat equal footing. Cornelis had seen the smoke signal sent by Hayes, but was reluctant to face the well-trained soldiers head on, however when a body count from the slaughter on Seal Island revealed that eight men were missing, his hand was forced. He was certain that the missing eight men had fled to Hayes and the soldiers on West Wallaby Island and told them everything. This presented a problem that simply could not be ignored. Due to the location northwest of the Mutineers Island, Hayes and the soldiers were closer to the route any rescue vessel from Batavia would take, giving them the chance to make first contact with any potential rescuer before Cornelis and his followers. Should this occur, the mutineers' elaborate plans to take over the rescue ship, escape and embark on a life of piracy would ultimately fail. Hayes and the soldiers simply had to be eliminated, however Cornelis and his men were little more than thugs and bullies. The victims so far had been unarmed men, women and children. Going up against Hayes and the soldiers would be no simple feat. This martial inexperience was clearly demonstrated when a series of amphibious landings made by the mutineers were decisively repelled. Pelted by a torrent of stones raining down from the high ground, the mutineers were forced to beat a humiliating retreat when Hayes and his soldiers came charging down towards them, the points of the vicious looking homemade pikes swiftly melting away the courage of the invaders. News of these defeats enraged an already deteriorating Cornelis, and with time rapidly running out, he personally led his remaining 37 men on an all-out attack against the hated soldiers. However, once again the woefully outmatched mutineers were crushed and forced to retreat, as Cornelis was captured alive, with three of his strongest and most feared lieutenants killed in battle. With the king held hostage by the enemy, the mutineers launched a final attack. Realising that they had nothing to lose, they knew that if they failed to take the island they were dead men. If this was the end, they intended to go down in a blaze of glory. This time they learnt from their mistakes and adapted their strategy, staying well away from the range of the soldiers slings, while keeping the enemy within range of their muskets slowly and methodically moving forward as they peppered the soldiers' positions with gunfire. This new and more patient strategy seemed to work, with three of Hay's men killed as the soldiers were gradually forced to fall back. In danger of losing control of the high ground, it seemed as though Hayes and the soldiers had lost the day. However, with the mutineers on the cusp of victory, the warring men who had once been shipmates on the Batavia spotted something on the horizon. A sail, a rescue ship had arrived. Amazingly, Commander Pelsart had successfully led his small party of survivors on the 33 day long journey to the port of Batavia, where he made contact with the Dutch East India Company and acquired a rescue ship from the colony's Governor General. Given strict orders to rescue the company's treasure, along with anyone who might still be alive, Commander Pelsart had returned to the site of the shipwreck that had almost ruined his career. Only by bringing back the lost vast hoard of wealth could he hope to redeem himself. Yet what he had expected to be a simple rescue mission was about to become a hellish tale of barbarism and depravity that would go down in history as perhaps the most infamous mutiny of all time. 
Both warring factions race to intercept the vessel first, the mutineers hoping to commandeer the ship for themselves, the soldiers intending to warn the rescue party aboard of the evil that was awaiting them. The lives of all depended on what was essentially a rowing race, as both factions' boats sped towards Commander Pelsart's rescue ship. Fortunately for the commander and his men on board, Hayes reached the ship first, and was thus able to present his side of the story, warning Pelsart of the events that had transpired, and the treacherous fate the mutineers had planned for him. Armed with the horrifying knowledge of the crimes that had taken place, Commander Pelsart turned his guns on the mutineers, who, after realising the game was finally up, surrendered and awaited judgement. Commander Pelsart now turned his attention to the grim task of dispensing justice, and more importantly, retribution. For the terrible atrocities the mutineers had committed, there could be only one outcome. Charged with the murder of over 120 survivors, the mutineers were interrogated and tortured until they signed confessions. The formality of a legal trial carried out on Seal Island itself, the commander unwilling to risk making the voyage back to Batavia with so many dangerous prisoners on board. Cornelis and six of his men were found guilty and sentenced to hang. The execution justly carried out on Seal Island, the site where so many innocents had been slaughtered by the hand just weeks earlier. All of the condemned had their right hands cut off with a hammer and chisel, all except for Cornelis, who had both hands removed. Two other mutineers were convicted of lesser crimes and marooned on mainland Australia, never to be heard from again, technically making them the first Europeans to settle on the Australian continent. The remaining mutineers were taken back to Batavia to be tried and punished, their sentences including being hanged, flogged, broken on the wheel, keel hoard, or dropped from the yard arm on the later voyage back home. Captain Jacobs, the man suspected of masterminding the original mutiny with Cornelis, and the one rumoured to be responsible for intentionally steering the Batavia off course, resulting in its shipwreck, did not confess to his role in the mutiny despite being tortured, and escaped execution due to lack of evidence. As for Commander Pelsart, despite bringing the sorry tale to an end, and successfully retrieving ten of the twelve treasure chests on board the shipwrecked Batavia, a company board of inquiry would later rule that as the man in sole charge of the expedition, he was at least partly responsible for the disaster, his assets were seized by the company, and the commander would die a broken man just a year later. Hayes and his small group of soldiers were promoted and would return home as heroes, hailed for their brave role in stubbornly resisting the mutineers, and bringing Cornelis's reign of terror to an end. Of the 332 people on board the Batavia, only 122 made it to the port of Batavia, their original destination. The tragic shipwreck, mutiny and subsequent crimes that took place, serving as a chilling reminder of the darkness that can lurk within the human heart, as well as a warning of the danger that can come from unchecked power held in the wrong hands. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I hope to see you again soon.